to all guests, delegates and everyone present here. I Tejaswini Bojappa and I Sanjana Garimella of MBA Hospital and Healthcare Management from Symbiosis Institute of Health Sciences are delighted to be the host for sorry. I'm deli are delighted to be the host for the session and the topic is violence against healthcare providers judicial pronouncements. Considering our current situation, healthcare workers are working endlessly. And it is the moral and legal duty to protect the healthcare workers from the violence they are facing. Violence against healthcare workers is unacceptable. It has not only a negative impact on the psychological and physical well-being of the healthcare staff, but also affects their job motivation. Sir is a medical legal expert. Dr. Sanjay Gupte has been in the clinical practice for more than 39 years and has been identified as a senior icon and a penultimate idol by the practitioners in his profession. Sir is a Secretary General of the World Gestosis Organization. He is a Director at Green Array Genomic Research and Solutions. Sir is a Chairman of the Committee for Ethical and Professional Aspects for the Human Reproduction and Women's Health under the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics. Sir has more than 150 publications in his credentials. We are very honored to have you here today, sir. I would like to request Dr. Sanjay Gupte, sir, to come up onto the dais and address the audience. So now from something intelligent, we are going to go on to something social. Uh, and I hope that after this talk, you don't wish that all the doctors should really be replaced by artificial intelligence. You know? <laughs> right. So, you know, we are having an epidemic of violence, as you know, everywhere. And this is a global phenomenon. Not only in our country, but everywhere else, the violence against doctor is increasing. Okay. So for this talk, you know, I've taken, you know, we'll go through all these things. You know, the trends, violence against healthcare professional, causes of violence, effect of these trends on society and healthcare, step to avoid violence prevention and interventions and finally can there be a legal deterrence can we do something about it ourselves i think the need is definitely there now mm, okay yeah i think i'm finally getting it right so this is the material that i have gone through if anybody wa else wants to refer to these things you know there are lots and lots of things, a lot of, uh, you know, legal cases also. There's no dearth of uh, the matter here. But this is what we see every day, you know, uh, uh, in the newspapers, on TV, everywhere. And this was one, of, in progress. one of the sad happenings. And look at this, you know, every day if you open the paper, somewhere you'll find all these issues, you know, the doctors being assaulted practically from large institute to smaller places. And uh, just imagine, this is in JJ Hospital, you know, Mumbai, the residents were attacked. This is, you know, in Dulay Hospital, this is what happened. Then again, you know, a uh, lot of pictures from, you know, other places. In Tutikorin, you know, Patient's husband actually, uh, a very senior gynecologist, who literally hacked to death with um, after the patient died. Yeah, no problem. That will be better, in fact. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, fine. So that, that makes it easier. Right. So, and of course, the, one of the recent happenings here. Then this is a very, very uh, recent happening, like in last a month or so, in uh, patient died of PPH, and this is what the doctor had to suffer. And again, this is the latest that's going on everywhere. This is, she was a uh, young gynecologist, a gold medalist. You know, she decided to work in a village near, you know, the you know, at Dausa, Rajasthan. And again, patient died due to PPH. And the relatives were okay, but you know, the, a lot of uh, political leaders came with, you know, and made a lot, a lot of halagul. And finally, uh, police put her 302 uh, in a fire, and she got uh, really worried and scared and committed suicide. Uh, 
So these things are very, very common. And we need to really think about it and think what we can do about it. So if you look at various studies, in our country, frankly, there are not too many studies. But this is a good uh, IMA study it was done. And what they found was 75% of doctors in India faced at least uh, some violence, 75% mark you, you know, so majority. So you, if you're not faced so far, you know, you're lucky, you know, so think of that. Okay, then nearly 50% of such violence is reported from intensive care units or post-surgery. Right. Then look at AIMS, you know, the most prestigious institute. This also stands here also, it, you know, stands at one of the top 10. And there's no surprise because the government hospitals uh, unfortunately bear the brunt of uh, due to various situations that we'll be uh, discussing. But what is different in India compared to, you know, uh, other countries? And this is what uh, it is, you know. Well, you will have in US, America, there will be patients who will attack doctors, but usually that is due to, you know, uh, personal issues and personal aspects and all that. But what happens in India is dramatically different. Here the patient, generally patient himself or herself are okay, the relatives, immediate relatives are okay because they've seen what's happening, you know, uh, what the doctor has done for them. But the violence is by other groups and often involving distant relatives, you know, unrelated people, lo local polit political leaders who often call themselves as social workers, and they take law in their own hands without, and this is important, without any fear of reprisal from any authority. And that's what is happening now. And when s in small towns this thing happens, you know, just imagine, suddenly a spontaneous group of 100, 200 people comes, you know, make a whole crowd and threaten the doctor, you know, create uh, violence. And what the hapless doctor is going to do, and the media is already there, you know, for you know, uh, the sensational coverage. And our politicians, yeah, they are always behind the doctors, you know, absolutely always, you know. So, but this is the way they are behind the doctors, as you can see, you know. <laughs> All right. Uh, the sad part is Indian mob has no fear of any action, retribution, punishment from police and other government authorities. You know, we did a study, this Karnataka Law Commission study, and if you see, hardly any FIRs were lodged, and if at all any FIRs were lodged, they were not followed, and there was hardly any punishment for any of the doctors. Same thing, this MLAG, Dr. Neeraj Agarwal, he works, you know, very diligently for the doctors in you know Punjab and all these places. He has his MLA AG group, medical legal action group, and he, he asked you know under RTI this for you know, what happens you know eight years the Punjab had a law you know against for violence against the doctors. What happened? Most of the complaints were not registered as per you know FIR. Whenever they were lodged. Later on, due to whatever reasons, there were com compromise reached, and that's why uh, among the parties and the case was not followed. And finally, in eight years, there is not a single person who has been actually punished uh, under this um, act. What about our doctor-patient uh, relationship uh, in our country? Well, the infarctions we have seen that occur everywhere nowadays. You know, the uh, road rage and everything uh, everywhere, but the Doctors are always soft target. And the people instigating the, you know, they take the law into their hand. And the simple excuse is, if you don't do that, you know, then who is going to punish the doctors? You know, doctors are well connected, you know, they'll get away. And that's the, you know, one of the reasons that's uh, given. And of course, they know that nothing is going to happen to them. Nobody's going to punish them. And well, uh, less said the better, the breaking news, hungry Indian media, you know, they're rushing, uh, you know, before even uh, the violence occurs, they're rushing, uh, uh, accusing the doctor, holding the doctor uh, responsible. And we have seen that daily, uh, you know, happening, especially, uh, you know, uh, reg regional news, you will find at least every day some such thing uh, happening around here. Right. Mob for hire. This is again a peculiarity of uh, you know um, uh, Indian situation. I was in Ludhiana once, you know, and I went around. I went for a lecture there and saw boards that you know Bharatis on hire. You see, I've seen that because you know there a lot of 
in, in our eyes, you know, the boys and they come from abroad and just a small family comes, but the wedding has to be really a big wedding. No? So Bharatis have to be there. So they, they, there are Bharatis on hire and everybody, all shopkeepers, everybody, you know, they close down their shops at 8, 830 dress up and go as Bharatis, you know, and then, you know, uh, enjoy the wedding, have their food and go back. So, and they get money for that also. So here also, unfortunately, this uh, one particular, you know, uh, family found that this is a good business and they, you know, in Calcutta, they were finally caught, you know, doing this. So, uh, bad roads, accident, patient dies in the hospital, hit the doctor. Huh? Well, Bad items, food poisoning, patient dies in the hospital, beat the doctor. Okay, bad heart, liver, patient dies in the hospital, again, beat the doctor. You know, no money, but doctor should serve free, so hit the doctor. You know. Again, bad train accident, patient dies in the hospital, you know, uh, hit the doctor, you know. And, Dirty dengue, child dies in the hospital again. The solution is single, you know, let's hit the doctor. Child dies in the hospital, uh, asthma, everything, yes. And complicated case, again, child dies, simple, hit the doctor. Right. So we are those who will never question our politicians, never hit corrupt babus, never hit corrupt businessmen. Hmm? We are the ones who only hit the doctors. And so can somebody suggest a doctor who can help this ailing society, you know? So, that's a, so, so well, causes of violence, there are many causes of violence. We have to heed to some of them and we have to look at these. And well, basically we are, we are regarded as, you know, uh, uh, in past, you know, it's a cliche saying as gods. But of course, amongst us also there are people who are extremely business-minded and though they are small in number, but they create a very bad impression amongst the patient and that's probably one of the causes that we have to accept. But again, sensationalization of news items. Well, there are so self-proclaimed social advisors, you know, uh, who advise us that, you know, lecturing on generic medicine, you know, you remember that, you know, Satya Meva Jayate. And now they advertise for brand medicine, you know, because they get paid for it, you know, and they call themselves social advisors, you know. Uh, so, the, okay. So, again, especially when it comes to, you know, uh, capacity of the government hospital, the situation is pretty bad, you know, uh, availability of drugs, including life-saving drug, diagnostic equipment, equipment, star sh shortages, so a lot of complaints are generated, and that's why I think government hospitals uh, bear the brunt uh, about this. Okay. Healthcare budget, we know that hardly 1, 1.2 of the GDP is being used, which I think in spite of COVID, unfortunately has not improved, and that's why the conditions remain pathetic in many of the government hospitals. Then if you see the small places, the small hospitals in India, you know, cover almost 84%, you know, uh, you know of the, um, you know, 84% are small hospitals, and they, you know, 33% uh, of healthcare expenditure is from government sources, and all remaining is out-of-pocket expenditure. So out-of-pocket expense of our healthcare pushes many households into poverty all over India, even though these are more affordable than the corporate hospitals, but still that creates friction, you know, at many places. Lack of faith in judicial process. Again, because, the, because mainly not because the judiciary uh, doesn't work, but it is slow. And that's why people always feel that, you know, whatever I do, if we, I go to the judiciary, I may get justice, but it may take years. And that creates, you know, uh, trouble. Uh, mob mentality is there, you know, emotional uh, turmoil. And not only emotional turmoil uh, with, uh, you know, as I said, so-called uh, leaders creating problems, but, you know, if the death of a patient is sometimes given the religious and caste color by some miscreants, especially if the doctor belongs to different caste or religion, that again is very particular of uh, our country. Uh, 
low healthcare literacy, yes, very much so, because how do you explain the patient certain things? You know, their understanding sometimes is so less that it's difficult to get across, and their what we call andhashraddha is so much that you know it's difficult to go through that and uh, explain the patient something like uh, this. What would a cardiologist do in this situation? Then. Unrealistic expression. Doctor, kuch bhi karo, lekin amara patient thik hona chahiye. You know, kuch bhi karo. You know, that's the usual thing that is usually you know said by the relatives without knowing that what the condition of the patient is, and then it happens severely anemic patient reaching hospital only for the delivery and dying of PPH. Who is responsible? You can't hold the you know doctor responsible in this situation. Cost of healthcare, though the costs are much less compared to any other country, and now we know this is the season, you know, uh, when uh, the holiday season and then December season, where all our, you know, great NRIs, you know, rush to India for treatment, you know, because they have holidays there, and you know the uh, treatment is much much cheaper here. So you know, so many dentists, you know, many of the practitioners have become clever now. They don't take holidays, you know, during that time because, you know, <laughs> so, all right, okay. So inadequate insurance cover. There's hardly any insurance, uh, you know, cover in a private setup for the private uh, patients, which needs to be improved. Poor communication. Now, this is something that we need to work on, and we have to heed to that. That you know, we are still many times you know paternalistic. You know, we tell the patient what the patient is supposed to do. We have to you know actually learn to respect the patient, understand the patient, and explain. You know, many of the places I've seen, especially you know in large places, because there is dearth of time, and that's why. The detailed discussion never happens. You know, the instructions are given, and the doctors expect the patients to follow the instructions. You know, without any questioning, that is not going to happen anymore. Even in you know public setups, and we have to learn to heed to that. And so, care caregivers must be trained in bre breaking bad news. Again, that is something very very important. It's always a dilemma. You know, if the patient, uh, you know, there was one. This is a long time back. The patient was brought to my hospital at 2 o'clock, who fell down in the house. She was pregnant, but some fell down in the house, in the bathroom, and nobody apparently came to know. They, by the time they came, you know, uh, realized that this is happening, they broke open the door, brought the patient uh, to the hospital. The patient was dead by the time uh, she was brought to the hospital. Now, what do we do? You know, if you explain to them suddenly, oh, you had brought a dead patient, again, you know, there can be a, a, a reaction of violence. If you don't take tell and you try and do something and then the patient dies, then they will say, oh, she was alive when you were, the patient was brought. Now, you know, now the patient is dead. So, it's in these situations it becomes difficult, and we have to have an a drill so exactly in what situation, who is going to say what, and we'll discuss a bit about it in a, uh, a little later. Lack of security, uh, you know, especially in small hospitals, is difficult nowadays to budget for even the nurses and the doctors. Leave aside security, so security is always uh, an uh, issue in small hospitals. Uh, quality of uh, primary care again, uh, you know, we are all rushing to become you know specialist, and so naturally the primary health care is lagging. The government is now trying to work on it, wellness centers, and all hope that sometimes it will happen. So that if the primary care is good, naturally the tertiary hospitals will not be loaded. Believe me, uh, you know, there was time when I gave a presentation to uh, uh, the National Health Council. This was about ten years back, and. Uh, then they decided, oh, this is a good idea. The most of the deliveries should occur, you know. And this was in front of, you know, uh, health minister, uh, then prime minister, and all that. And they said, okay, this is a good idea. We should shift to uh, institutional deliveries. And then they came out with ideas like you know, that JKS scheme. If you come to the hospital uh, for delivery, you will be paid and all that. And later on, in <laughs> Years time, what started up happening, and I visited many hospitals in Rajasthan and all. There were so many patients in the tertiary hospitals for delivery because they were getting, you know, uh, uh, money uh, paid. That there are two or three patients per bed, you know. So whenever these things happen, 
it's impossible for the doctors to you know manage things so so what happens the trends on the you know uh, society and healthcare professionals i think you can imagine and so we can give, go through that negative consequences on the doctors on the you know, societies uh, the access to primary care goes on reducing among the healthcare workers there is frustration demoralization stress as you saw the doctor finally committed suicide getting scared of that the performance gets affected and this is again another uh, ima survey told us that 82% of the doctors in india feel stressed out in their profession 46.3% fear the violence as main cause of stress it 24% doctors fear being sued 62% of the doctors surveyed are unable to see their patients without any fear of violence and 57% have thought of hiring security in their uh, uh, premises so this is what comes to especially all the doctors kids you know they, they have started saying that anybody but doctor you know I will, i'll be i'll go into artificial intelligence <laughs> so that's better <laughs> you know okay so uh, for the community of course compensation claims unemployment disruption in family life uh, social life and so on even the organization suffer the organization you know uh, image suffers there are disruption in services we know what happened to uh, singani hospital totally you know um, burned down you know uh, as a violence so what now this is something tangible that we can think of what can we do there is of course dire need Uh, to prevent, you know, make the facilities safe, and all of us have to think how we can, you know, do that. So, healthcare professionals become reluctant to handle serious patients, and this is happening now. You know, if something a little beyond, they will, you know, previously one used to manage the patient, even if the patient is very serious, do whatever you can immediately. But now patients uh, are tend to be, you know, ref referred more, and uh, you know, the society is the loser. what can go the government do a lot of things first of all they have to accept that you know workplace violence is important and this should not happen in uh, healthcare uh, situations at least collect the data statistically see what are the causes are talk to the healthcare workers and there should be a zero tolerance for violence and we all have to you know act in that uh, direction and we'll discuss about the you know one of the uh, resolutions or a bill which was brought in but didn't see the uh, actually light of the day uh, hasn't seen it till now but the recent judgment that jora tun the assam doctor i told you the court there actually showed spine and the perpetrator the chief perpetrator was actually, uh, you know uh, uh, death by hanging was the punishment announced so something like that if the judiciary starts doing a little dawn on people that no they can be held responsible and consequences will be there what can the employers do again you know now we have co corporate employers we have you know big hospitals and again the hospitals have to have policies they have to have you know uh, plans they have to have adequate insurance not only for the uh, hospital for but for the uh, you know in individual suffering they have to consult their doctors and uh, basically promote awareness not only amongst the uh, doctors patients but also community uh, at large then uh, healthcare workers themselves need to contribute they have to again be aware and take steps learn get themselves trained as we'll uh, discuss a bit later about this what can the professional associations do you know at least again they can make you know the community aware and that is what we did you know the figo the international federation of gynecology and obstetrics as a chair of this committee we brought out a document to make the uh, countries aware and we sent it to all the you know international governments that this is not the healthcare violence is there and it is not acceptable and laws are to be brought in believe me the uh, many westerners in my committee initially resisted the idea because they said no no it's not in our country it's not such a big issue so why are you trying to bring it finally they accepted and finally now it is the this particular document has gone to you know all the governments across the uh, world 
community at large yes we have so many active ngos who you know uh, you know work for the patients work for the community but they also have to work to see that the violence is reduced and a lot of things they can do here then prevention and intervention so what can we do as interventions again the there can be as we say in medicine primary prevention secondary prevention and tertiary prevention then organizational interventions need to be there so proper staffing at proper place and as he was describing you know if you look at this we have to have some intelligent ideas of where the staff is lacking and where at what situation the staffing should be better who should man uh, the particular uh, places information and uh, communication with the patients public you know, what happens if you are in a in a large general hospital you will find and if the, your patient is uh, having a, a problem which is handled by multiple specialties you will find that one specialist will come and talk about only you know his own thing uh, you know whatever say hematologist will talk about something then uh, you know maybe a diabetologist will come and talk about his own things the patients relatives are totally confused about what's happening to the patient they feel that not one single person is finally in charge because you ask them a patient is having pain they say oh that pain consultant will come and tell you you know what to do about it and all that so the so the treatment is so fragmented that that gets the patients frustrated and that's why we have to look at this uh, you know when we uh, treat the patients uh, in our uh, hospitals this is important we have different codes there should be this code purple if uh, violence is anticipated or is about to happen then you know there has to be some code where everybody is alerted and the doctor is protected and this is something now time has come that we you know worked on that and I, i'll tell you another recent uh, the example i saw in one of the large orthopedic famous orthopedic hospitals of one of our teachers in uh, city of pune only uh, two you know fighting groups came in you know and they were fighting amongst themselves and you know about to create violence they had a code, you know code system where they you know brought in all their you know uh, workers maushis and mamas and everybody 50 60 people of the hospital came and confronted they just stood with you know all the you know these maushis in front and you know these male workers behind and formed a huge chain immediately looking at that strain of you know hospital workers the parties were quarreling and started quieting down so you have to have these drills you know in the hospital and i was so happy seeing that that somebody is actually you know uh, uh, you know working for it so premises there have to be two exits so even if your own hospital is there make sure that you are an exit because the first thing is you need to save yourself then all the things come you know all the other things will uh, come later there have to be alarm system the alarms and alarm systems have to be silent alarm system you know otherwise the person will become more aggressive you know if you put in an alarm so all this like in banks and all they have nowadays so we have to work on that so uh, plus after you you know you know uh, press that alarm there has to be a, a reliable response system otherwise you know that doesn't help you at all so that again has to be you know uh, worked on and the training there has to be you know actually uh, people have to be trained to see what how you are going to handle the violence preparing a core group of mature and specially competent staff and workers representatives who can take responsibility for more you know complicated interactions like patient is very serious suddenly a uh, patient has become serious on table surgery is going on you know these are the situations where the seniors have to be roped in and they have to uh, also help in facing the uh, issue then of course not only at the event but after the event lot of things happen especially the person who has suffered you know uh, many times they are so depressed they don't feel like again you know entering the hospital want to quit the practice so psychological help rehabilitation help everything is uh, important uh, in this situation well individual intervention stage so what can you do as a uh, you know uh, doctor for yourself so 
First of all, remember this, do not overreach. You know, look at your capacity, look at what you can do, look at what your hospital can do, and only do that much that you can. You know, don't go overboard by you know, promising or doing things that uh, you're not able to manage. Then consent, don't think that it is just a formality. The consent nowadays, the Supreme Court has also given the detailed direction and it has to be absolutely proper and correct and give time because that is something, that is a kind of communication that really helps later on if you have taken the, you know, into account all these issues in the, in the consent itself. Of course, documentation, very important because minute the violence and all occurs, police will come, take away all your papers, and you'll have nothing to show. So proper documentation, at on-time documentation, and also keeping copies of that is important. Communication, again, improving. We just talk about improving the communication skill. Uh, I know it's important, again. Then be alert, you know, remember the situation. If a mishap has occurred, if you know that the patient or relatives are not going to be happy, first be alert that, well, violence may occur, you know, and create a team. Don't go and face the, uh, you know, whole uh, uh, crowd of people alone, you know. Uh, take your whatever, your co-workers and along and be there. So be alert about the uh, violence itself. Okay. Then there should be standard procedure. Suppose the violence is to occur, as I said, what response, who is going to do what, this should be worked on, there should be mock drills also. If you have fire drills, if you have treatment drills, why not drill to save the, yourself? You know, so these drills have to be, you know, worked on. And quick response teams, you know, the professional organizations can come in. We have, you know, uh, and quick response teams created here in the city of Pune with the uh, retired police, uh, police uh, people, you know. If you pay them a little bit, a retainer, they're happy, they're retired, but they know how to handle the mob, and there is a group of people who are working for it, so, you know, those are the kind of people who are, they are ready to take calls and come to the hospital if required, so even small hospitals can, you know, avail of uh, these steps. First, and these are the immediate steps. First, save, you, save yourself, do not meet anger with anger, remain calm, uh, depute, uh, you know, someone. So all these steps are, you know, measured steps which need to be taken in these uh, situations. Uh, inform your lawyer, inform police immediately. By the way, always be good to police people around you. You know, give them free services, you know, go to the police stations, you know, that helps a lot, you know, right? When, uh, no, do not try to settle the issue by paying hush money or, or because that is like accepting, your, you know, your fault. So that gets you in more trouble than solving your uh, problem. Well, can finally be there a possibility of legal deterrence? Now, let's see where the legality of all this stands. So, these are the various judgments. In Jammu Kashmir, judgment in this Usmail and others, the High Court of Jammu Kashmir pointed out that such violence highlights dangerous consequences like the spread of infection, imperiling uh, healthcare professionals, damage to public, that is violence they are talking about. And all this started happening during COVID because I think judiciary and everybody realized the importance of healthcare workers mainly during uh, you know, uh, COVID issues. So even the Apex Court came up with the idea that the, uh, the doctors and healthcare workers must be given uh, protection that was in this uh, Gerald Bennett case. All right. Okay. Again, in this, the Kerala High Court observed that uh, apart from subjecting doctors to agony and anguish, attacks and violence on them adversely affect the treatment of all the patients. So finally, everybody is waking up to it, and that's a good sign. And this was the, um, you know, uh, 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 one kind of a healthcare uh, uh, bill which was to come in 2019 it was proposed and you know they criminalized the uh, you know both commission and incitement to commission of violence against healthcare professionals and damage to the property of clinical however it never saw the light of the day the bill was stalled citing reasons that existing provisions under ipc already covered the elements of violence and so this a comparatively a good bill but has not was not passed and then uh, again then came the epidemic then again everybody woke up then uh, there the old act you know epidemic diseases act was uh, uh, actually you know uh, uh, brought out and then um, this uh, amendment came in and this amendment was quite good for the doctors but again you know was it a fair amendment during the 
uh, epidemic, it was fair because something drastic had to be done. But there was, uh, you know, provision, a presumption to be guilty of the offence unless proved otherwise by the accused and dependent. So again, it was opposed, and then uh, people said, no, we need a balanced approach. You can't say, ki, you know, or accused or presumed to be guilty, that that is something that judiciary cannot accept. Now what has happened recently, after all this violence, the IMA has gone writ, with writ petition to the Supreme Court. What they are asking is to decriminalize any harm done in line of treatment for the doctors. I think, you know, always what we ask for and what we are going to gain, we have to think twice, you know, because the same thing we did, and I, I was uh, at the forefront at that time where we were talking about CPA. And we had mentioned, mod asked for modification of CPA, you know, that uh, Shanta case, that let there be medical tribunals who will decide rather than, you know, judiciary deciding. Maybe at that time it were, would have been accepted. But the, that time also I may said, no, we don't want CPA at all to be applied. The Supreme Court threw out this. So again, I think, uh, unfortunately, if they insist on this, I don't think the Supreme Court is going to say, because, you know, there can be, you know, criminal action by the doctors also. So you can't say that, you know, decriminalize all the healthcare thing, but we have to ask for proper, you know, modifications as required. This is a better suggestion by, uh, you know, uh, Neeraj Agarwal's group that, you know, if violence is there and then the patient goes with a complaint against the doctor anywhere, the, all the spora, because violence was there, they should reject that. They should not, you know, take it into account. I think that's a better suggestion to avoid the violence at least, you know. So that's something that we can think of. Then can we propose a will? So thinking about what we can do, yeah, we can take help of what the Supreme Court has already said. You know, in Jacob Matthews' case, Supreme Court actually came out with <clears throat> its own guidelines and it wanted the government to actually act on those guidelines and act, uh, create an act. Well, partially that was done in NMC, uh, NMC Act, but it's only partial. So again, we have to go to the Supreme Court, and this is the right time to do so, and say that you only said that you know these uh, you know th uh, things should be applied and implemented. So if we go out to the Supreme Court with this kind of you know argument, that see you have only said that 304A which is uh, you know, applied. If it is to be applied to healthcare workers, it needs to be modified. How can that be you know, on the, uh, you know, uh, modified? That, uh, yes. So how can, what the Supreme Court says, says here, that if it's uh, an act of negligence or act of uh, uh, rash or negligence act by the doctor, it, if the doctor is to be arrested, it has to be a gross negligence, not just simple. And this is sadly even our, you know, many of the expert committees don't understand. Many times, you know, the expert committees are, you know, apply, you know uh, put in place for arguing the case of a uh, doctor, you know, from many government hospitals and medical colleges. And what happens? They find, oh, the, the signature uh, of the, on the consent was not proper, or you know, this paper was not written properly. So that means the doctor was negligent. Are, what are we? We are talking about arrest of a doctor. So it has to be a gross negligence, and that even our expert committees have to know that they have to, you know, only opine whether it's a gross negligence or not. They are not supposed to, you know, that they let the judiciary decide anywhere in CPA or whatever, you know, all the, these small things that are there. But the expert committees, because they are asked for arrest of the doctor, they should only look at gross negligence, if it at all there, and that is what is said by Supreme Court itself. So whatever the Supreme Court has actually offered us, our expert committees do away with it. And that's the sad part of the uh, story, and that's why we have to, uh, you know, beg. then what about the law against the violence? Yes, we can act, you know, we need a, a central act, but not just central act, but IPC needs to be only if you make an act and if the police don't know that. So IPC, is, you know, the Indian Penal Code has to be also modified there. The problem of the present law is that the violence has occurred, doctor files a police complaint, and simultaneously the patient and relatives also uh, file complaint. Finally, what happens? You know, the doctor is scared, there is a compromise, and when the other leaders and all are fighting in the court of law, the, uh, the doctor has already settled the case with the patient, and, and nothing goes forward, and those leaders who are also fighting for the doctors, you know, they, they fail, uh, fall flat. So if 
on providing proof of violence, any complaint of alleged negligence by a patient party uh, could be declared void ab initio, automatically this will act as a strong deterrent in future incidences. And again, the you know whatever is said in epidemic at, act at least partially modified should be there that presume if the violence is there why not presume let the you know the uh, people who have created the violence prove their mentality rather than uh, you know uh, other way around so onus of proof should be uh, you know on them and there should be punishment for which they have to pay if they can't pay you know the, the revenue recovery act is there which should be used so this is the kind of action if we ask, I'm sure the judiciary will also appreciate it and act on it, but we all have to go ahead and start doing it. So in conclusion, violence against our doctors bears of course, ill for the society. It is important for all medical practitioners to be aware that this can occur and they need to take steps to prevent it. Doctors need to pressurize the government to equate assault on a doctor with assault on a public servant on duty. Necessary changes should be made urgently in IPC and criminal procedure code to have a different uh, effect and prevent future incidents of violence against doctor. However, for this to happen, a coordinated effort is needed. Let's hope no more healthcare personnel lose their lives to violence before action is initiated by their uh, associations. Um, and the government. And let's hope that this situation doesn't come any further. You know. Okay, so the, to avoid this, we have to coordinate ourselves and act fast. Otherwise, pretty soon, you know, this is what you'll be saying, uh, you know, outside your operation theater. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for the very insightful session, sir. Now, the session is open for questions. I think everybody is hungry and want to go for lunch. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> so, thanks for your very uh, detailed class, sir. Uh, I can add uh, one more point with that, sir. Sure. One is lack of protocols at the ground level in many of the hospitals in our country. Correct. Lack of un uniformity in the treatment of many, many cases. According to the patient, any appendicitis is appendicitis, but it is not so for many of the surgeons. And I think the most important point is lack of unity among the doctors in our country. And Quite what is right. your views? I think that is that is very in improving important. in all first, these aspects. First of all, we have to unite. We know there are pathies in our you know branches, but they are there and they are going to be there. So first of all, I have always requested you know the people from IMA and you know from other pathies also. So as doctors, let's unite. There are so many things that we need to do together, and unless we come together, then only you know the uh, we can. Uh, you know, pressurize the government into acting. Here, what's happening is, you know, in PCP and DT Act, I found, and sorry to say that, Mr. Doctor Radiologist, that radiologists were acting against gynecologists. You know, so you know, in our country, that they, then, of course, you know, I am going against, you know, uh, Irish people and all that. This is this is not the way we, we can ever achieve you know, unity, and this is not the way we can ever achieve what we want really. You know, so. I'm glad you said that, yes, we have to have the unity, we have to come together, no matter what path it is, for some reasons at least, to save our lives now, we have to come together. Please. Excellent lecture. I really appreciate. Thank you. It's a very difficult field to deal with, and you've obviously done a lot of work. Uh, you were talking about uh, having a doctor to cure the ailing society, which uh, is absolutely correct. I just have one thought on the primary prevention part and uh, would like your opinion as well. Uh, one of the key method to prevent this kind of violence, especially when people are in rage, is not the fact that you have these laws and if, because they are all protocols, everything is thrown out when the rage happens, especially it's a mob and the rage happens and you attack. 
But uh, communication skills is very important for any doctors. And uh, that has been lacking in our system. Yes. So one suggestion, if I may, is, you know, have a chapter on communication skills or why violence happens. Maybe we can start at a grassroots level, like medical education. Because as far as I know, medical education has not changed much since the last so, two decades. I think... Uh, so symbiosis uh, may be a perfect uh, institute to start uh, yeah, but, this uh, but the communication skills or the soft skills. No, but recently, even the, you know, the uh, MCI has come out with new education system and where initially only these things are taught and Dr. Zamkar I think, and Dr. Uh, Natarajan will, uh, you know... We are absolutely uh, right. When we were... Uh, learning MBBS, uh, no teacher talk us about communication skills. In fact, uh, there was no communication between us as well. <laughs> and my basic uh, hypothesis is 50% of violence is because of communication skills. Because of? Communication skills. Yes, yeah, of course. We are never trained. We, even if uh, we are asked to explain, we start talking in medical terms. PO to come here, he just said, <laughs> now, everything has changed. Now we have something called as a foundation course, where there are protocols to be taught, communication skills, how to deliver bad news. Now, as MUHS Vice Chancellor, we took first primary efforts that we had in communication skills incorporated in all medical colleges in across all MBBS. And uh, because we are all exam-oriented, so in a long case, there are five marks given for communication skills. So I think that's how we are. And now NMC has come with a big thing, and I think now, now the future of doctors won't be hit by, for lack of communication skills. Right. Good evening. Uh, I have a question here, this Where side. Are you? On your right. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> let me introduce myself. Yeah. I am advocate Nikitesh Kotangre, practic mm -hmm. practicing at Bombay High Court. Okay. Uh, I am dealing with two cases of medical negligence, one on the side of the victim and another on the side of the doctor. Oh, Both are different. I won't, yeah, <laughs> uh, I won't reveal the details. Okay. But uh, I have a question that is, how do we define the gross negligence? The reason is because in one case, uh, he is a private practitioner and he is made a scapegoat by your own association. That is the reason uh, this, the case of medical negligence under uh, Section 304A of IPC has been raised. So how do we define this gross negligence? Because we are advocates, we don't understand the medical terms. We have to learn those and then we have to fight the case for him. Okay. I'm glad in you the, accepted that, you know. Uh, in the purview of judiciary, we can fight it, but how do we fight in the association? That's where we always feel that there have to be, you know, expert committees of doctors who will, because in every case that gross negligence will change. There are so many branches and so many things, you know, and the uh, expert group of doctors, a panel of doctors will be able to decide in that particular case whether it is to be cross, uh, called as gross negligence or not. And you know, so that's where the help, even now the Supreme Court has also said, the NMC Act is also saying that call the at least two specialist doctors and take their opinion. Because in every single, there is no generalization. In every, a gross negligence one can at the most say that, you know, uh, what you call of res ipsa locator cases, you know, operating on the wrong limb, leaving, you know, sponge inside. You know, these are the, they can be taken as gross negligence. But other than that, you know, it has to be a doctor's panel who decides in that particular case. Actually, sir, Thank you. Sure, sure. is gross negligence. This cannot be disputed. This is what even our courts are saying, everything is saying. So yes, small points about gross negligence can differ from case to case. But if a doctor operating under influence of alcohol is a gross negligence. Yeah. Like this. See, Sponge but has again, been left. Again but the, we cannot, you know, again the, we, tell you that why is what happens uh, uh, no, again when we I'll go to law. Why, why because you, the advocates are always like this. No, no but I, I, sir, I just, I just I tell you <laughs> what, what you said. Suppose that there is a, a small town, only one gynecologist, one surgeon, 
the you know gynecologist has gone out somewhere for whatever reason yeah. or ill or something yes the patient has to be a cesarean section has to be done the surgeon comes and does it or he says no i can't i can't change my so it depends on the lo locality rules locality things so it changes from case to case and situation to situation so then we cannot say anything about gross negligence hmm? no we can We can what, still. What do you think is gross negligence? According As I to said, you, you know, ki you know, rapes, rapes are locator cases. You know, so but that is uh, the only cases that. That's probably the only. Th that's why because we are talking of criminal negligence here. So, okay, sir. The criminal negligence. Another thing about uh, the increase in cases of negligence is because of disparities between government and private, and no representation from private uh, hospitals. All the. committees all everything that is made let's take a doctor from aims let's take a doctor from here what about the private hospitals mostly government hospitals have uh, we all have worked in government hospitals we are now working in private hospitals so what they should be is a perspective from the private hospital also that should be put towards but, the government but th that, that is that, that is will, not happening i absolutely agree but when will that happen if we are all together Yeah. we show unity tell the government see all this uh, you know um, uh, faculties branches pathies are together and we want these these thing see i'll tell you in, uh, abroad what happens is uh, when this uh, your gynecologist you said uh, the, the hrt you know that study came w uh, study came and hrt was to be banned the uh, i was in canada at that time the canadian government asked the gynec and obstetric society you know what we should do and then they opined ki you know, certain things and then the government took act, you know to action on that does it happen here never it can never happen here you know because who are they to ask what do they so our societies our professional societies have to also really reach those professional standards then only will will you know get representation sad to say i was on mmc you know as you know i was on mci but i still feel that we also have to show a lot of improvement before we can you know when we go and ask otherwise nobody is going to just offer us things you know on platter because everybody there is even in the government if you see and that again i have seen at is level there is always a, a, you know a sort sort of a dispute between technologist and the you know technocrats and the administrators Yes. so i have uh, is officers will always try to you know uh, overtake uh, the uh, technocrats in the system system so this, this, there are a lot of issues there but what is important is our unity let's start with that you know yeah thank you thank you so much sir i would like to request dr arun jamkan sir distinguished professor siu and advisor smcw and symbiosis university of hospital resource center to felicitate mm -hmm. dante gupta sir well done mm -hmm. thank you thank you sir for sharing your time and knowledge with us with that we come to an end of the pre conference symposium of the day we would now invite you for lunch which has been arranged at symbiosis medical college for women courtyard there are three exits in the auditorium three at the front and one at the back so delegates are requested to use their exit proximate to them I also request the delegates sitting at the balcony to use the exit at the top for convenience.